Thanks, Stephanie. And yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the great introduction. I rarely get a clap at the start. That's very good. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, one thing um, uh, the thing uh, that maybe doesn't know about me is that I, I grew up here actually, uh, but somehow amazingly I've never been in uh, any of the UDM buildings despite having like many contacts with UDM. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to be back in Montreal. Um, I just want to say before I, I start, this is actually uh, work that was done 95% by my intern. I think it's really uh, cool work, but my first, the first author here, Zoom Lee, uh, he was really responsible for like a lot of this work. So I'm just going to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so some motivations for this work. Um, so overall, what we want to do, and just like this is a very broad and general statement, is that like we want to find uh, general agents, right? So like you know, that's, that's what I want to do. That's like my life goal is to, to design general agents that can, you know, respond generally, act in a way that, uh, you know, generalizes across different tasks, different games, different environments, um, and, you know, with different uh, types of other agents, like people maybe. Um, and so that's the kind of the broad general role, uh, but, you know, to, for, you know, to, to define it in the scope of an internship project, of course, we have to get a little more specific than that. Um, so for this project, uh, we thought, okay, we're gonna we're gonna deal with agents that uh, employ reinforcement learning. So there are L agents. Uh, we're gonna try to leverage game theoretic analysis wherever we can, um, <clears throat> and we're gonna use search when the model is or the environment is like simulatable. So that's maybe still a bit kind of uh, an overview of what we do uh, in this in this work. But um, let me get a bit more concrete. So. We're going to take a look at what I've been calling now game theoretic reinforcement learning, but I mean a very specific, something very specific by that, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, and in particular, uh, we're going to look at bargaining uh, or bargaining theory is going to kind of inspire like some of the methods uh, and, and generative models in search. So this is a, I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. This is actually a paper that take that builds a lot on, on existing work. Uh, and we're sort of adding new things to the existing work. Uh, so it's a bit of a challenge to describe because I have to tell you a bit about how, you know, why those additions are important, uh, why we care about them, but a little bit also about the, the existing work that it builds on top of. Okay, but that's fine because we have a lot of nice pictures to do that. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to talk about game theor theoretic RL, uh, but really I mean a very specific thing, which is uh, this algorithm called policy space response oracle. So it might appear... Um, I hope it appears obvious to you uh, that, uh, you know, this is a natural way to do multi-agent reinforcement learning, but let me tell you a little bit uh, about what I mean or why I think that. Um, okay, so in, in, the, uh, in the problem of multi-agent reinforcement learning, you have several agents in an environment and they're all trying to learn something or adapt to each other's uh, behavior. Uh, in particular, we're going to deal with multi-agent uh, environments. So there's multiple agents that are learning in the environment with each other, okay? So the task uh, could be adversarial uh, or competitive. It could be cooperative. It could be mixed. For now, I'm not going to specify that, but the important part is you're going to have multiple agents that are learning from each other. Okay. If you try to cast this as a just a standard reinforcement learning problem, you get into problems with theory, like the foundations um, of the single agent RL case uh, are, are, it's hard to satisfy some of the like necessary requirements, like such as Markovianness and things like this. Um, so, uh, you know, the branch of multi-agent reinforcement learning has kind of emerged from the, like a game theoretic roots. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about what I mean by one specific algorithm uh, in this setting. So what each player is going to do, they're going to have like a meta agent. Okay, so what each player is going to do is maintain like a set of different policies and they're going to learn a set of different policies and they're going to grow that set over time in a very specific way described by these pictures. Okay, so the PSRO, uh, that's what I'm gonna call it, PSRO, stands for policy based response oracles, and it's gonna grow this policy set. So you have a data, every every agent has this database of policies, and it's just gonna start with like the random policy, right? Just like you would in regular reinforcement, right? Okay, and it's gonna set, It's uh, the agent is gonna set itself to the, it's gonna sample policy from the database, it's gonna set, uh, it to the random one because it's the only one that we have. And then uh, it's going to sample an example opponent policy. So you're kind of doing this in parallel with another player. Just think of the two player case for now. And maybe we're trying to learn something like, uh, like, uh, like uh, poker. Like we want to learn how to play poker. 
It's going to be important actually that uh, I'm going to assume pretty much all of all of the environments in this talk are going to be partially observable. So like there's going to be some kind of hidden information. Not all the players know everything about the world. Uh, and this is the two player competitive setting. Right. So we've we've drawn all we've done so far is drawn an opponent, um, which is the random policy, because all of the players sets of policies are starting out with just a random, a uniform random policy. OK, so what PSRO does is basically build up this like uh, what I'm going to call a metagame. Right. A metagame is essentially like a normal form game. Like once you have uh, once you simulate a number of policies, you can actually try to get its like expected utility. So in the game of poker, maybe there's a bias towards the first side or or, or, or the others for the second one. Uh, so this won't necessarily be zero. If you play the, you know, if the first player plays random and the second player plays random, you're going to get some estimated utility for playing those two policies together. Okay. And then what's going to happen is everything in purple here is going to be solved. You're going to have a solution that treats that thing as a normal form game and solves it. So under that, like you're building up like a, an abstract metagame and you're going to solve that game and you're going to take that solution and that's going to guide your, your search on how to add new policies to these sets. Okay. Now, the what do we do next? Well, once we have this metagame, we actually want to grow the set of policies that we're building here. And the way that we do that is we just employ like a uh, like an approximate best response. So suppose you know the opponent's playing random and we want to do better than random. One thing we can do from them is just set up like a reinforcement learning style problem, play against them, and try to do as best we can given that they're playing that they're their uh, policies that are sampled from the set. Okay, so we can use uh, DQN DQ networks. That's a good default algorithm, right? Um, deep reinforcement learning, like super basic algorithm, uh, to the to find an approximate best response. And once we have that approximate best response, we train that for a while. Uh, we add it to our policy set. Okay, and the opponent does the same. So maybe when we sample in the next iteration, we sample our DQN agent, and we sample random for the opponent. So our DQN is agent is going to learn against random for the opponent. We do this for a while, and then we kind of incrementally build our little sets of oracles like all of them. Okay, and then we just keep doing this. We keep iterating this, right? So this is just one way to to you know employ like multi-agent reinforcement learning in a game theoretic way, and we're building up like a basically this normal form meta game on the bottom here. Okay, so this was in 2017. So uh, it's basically inspired by Double Oracle, if you ever heard of that. Um, it's kind of like bringing it into the uh, extensive form setting uh, or the sequential setting, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know adding reinforcement learning on top of it. Okay, so here's the same algorithm, but in a different a bunch of pictures. Okay, so these are the neural networks, like each one of those, what I call oracles or policy sets. You can think of them as neural networks, basically inputs of, from observations to poly, to actions. Okay, once we have those, we can compute. Uh, it, what I showed you a second ago was the two-player case, but you can, in the multiplayer case, you can have a tensor of utilities that get estimated for each one of these policies if you were to just simulate them together. And this is called empirical game theoretic analysis. Basically, treat this thing as a as a normal form game, solve it. It's kind of like an abstract game. Okay, and then you go over to this other side, and you have this real. You have this best response step. We are now trying to compute a best response to uh, the behavior that you're seeing here. So you're sampling a bunch of policies, computing a best response to the uh, some kind of meta distribution over these policies. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the action space is discrete, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Very large or like... Oh, the action space could be okay. as large as you want. Okay. Uh, but uh, think of think of games like uh, maybe 10 to 1,000 actions or something. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the, the main motivation behind all this is that uh, when you're in the multi-agent setting, especially if you're in the competitive setting, you might want to uh, approximate the Nash equilibrium, right? Especially in a two-player zero-sum setting, because the Nash equilibrium gives you some nice guarantees in that setting. Um, and so it's really strongly, like this this technique was really strongly motivated by the two-player zero-sum setting, okay? So here's where I tell you, I've been doing work in two-player zero-sum games for a very long time, like 15 years or something. And in the last few years, I, I, I just got, increasingly interested in, well, 
maybe increasingly bothered by the fact that, you know, everything that I had been working on didn't really have like a nice extension, you know, because I always thought like, oh, I'm going to work on two players or some games and eventually I'm just going to get more general than that. Um, and it turns out getting more general than that is actually really tough, really hard. Um, you can't just, you know, you can't just really take everything that you'd worked on before and then just extend it to the end player general sum case. It just, you know, you have to think a bit, you have to do a bit more than that. But, uh, but a lot of this work was motivated by how can we take this general algorithmic framework and apply it to a much more general case? So, yeah. Yeah, before you go on, uh, something I don't quite understand. Why is there a pool of predators? Why not just ah, you... the latest? Sorry, so why not why what? Why just take the latest policy? Oh, yeah, one? that's because, uh, that's because you, you're essentially building up uh, the support of an equilibrium. And you can think of each one of those policies as being like, one of the items in that support. Um, so that's not necessarily by this method representable as one network. So each one of these oracles are really best responses. So often they're going to be very pure. Yeah, but they're best responses to the, the previous like worst policies. Right? The best responses to a mixture of the previous iterations. Yeah, okay. that's right. So, so like you want to think of this thing as kind of like an approximate version of the bigger game. Yeah. And the way it's approximate is that it's yeah maintaining like a set of policies okay. that kind of then, summarize its support space. Then afterwards, say like you learn to play chess or, yeah. or something like that. Yes. Uh, like after in practice, what do you do? Don't you just use the decision taken by the latest? So if you were to learn chess, I would absolutely recommend I mean, that. I'm thinking <laughs> an example. But... If you have, for example, poker, that just doesn't work. So what's going to happen? The reason that doesn't work is because the last iterate yeah. is going to be very is going to be tend to be very uh, like deterministic because it's trying to be a best response yeah. and in poker that you can't do that okay. like in games like where you have partial observability in general you might need to mix your strategy okay. because you want to avoid giving away your information so what would you do you would sample you, you take so so that's what this meta solver does this meta strategy solver here the the one that creates this distribution mm -hmm. it computes like a nash equilibrium over this set of uh, policies okay. and so you return the set plus that meta distribution yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. yeah. But different opponents, they share, uh, they share the same database of policies? Uh, no, no, because in general, you can have an asymmetric game. So the action space of player one and the action space of player two are not necessarily the same. Because they all start with random and each one of them Yeah, they all start with a uniform policy. random policy, that's right. Yeah. But like in, in, for example, in chess, you might not play black and white the same way, right? In poker, it's absolutely the case. If you go second, you're at a disadvantage, or sorry, you're at an advantage, depending on the poker bank. But like, you you want to think of the asymmetric case where you don't necessarily have uh, observations that uh, make sense for both player one and player two that are the same, right? Like you might be playing on different a, a different part of the board, or you might be playing on completely separate boards or something. Um, and going first and going second are completely different, uh, like roles. So that's why when you when I say multiple agents, it's really like each one of the agents are controlling one side of the board. So if you're in a two player game, you have a meta agent for player one. If you have a three player uh, and two, if you have a three player game, you have a meta agent for player one, two, and three. And they're all building policy sets. That's why you get an explosion here. Yeah, but the chosen policy of each player is shared with the other players. Who... Uh, it's it's only you only simulate them when you're learning your best response. So in training. You have access to everything and then you just simulate them and then while you're building up your best response you're able to simulate from them okay but you're so not sharing each policy. that's right each policies are completely separate like all the policy sets are completely separate yeah so you're learning like a set of policies for all the players yeah. okay so that that was um in 2017 there was a lot of work that kind of followed up on this yeah yes yeah, sir okay. Is, yeah. is it like um, uh, disrupting a complete scenario for all the situations? Oh yeah, yeah. You could think of it like that. If if it if it goes on forever, right? Like the reason you can say this converges to an equilibrium, if you have infinite memory and infinite time, is because you're going to keep enumerating. Like if there's a best response that exists that's not currently in your set, you will enumerate it, right? And then you'll do that for all players. And if you do that forever, you'll eventually enumerate the support of the of the full equilibrium of the game. It's an extremely inefficient way to do it, <laughs> but but you can think of it that way. Yeah. So the reason that uh, the reason this might work 
over say doing the exhaustive way is that uh, in the best response step here, you turn this into a reinforcement learning problem. Now you can import all of the nice results in machine learning and you know deep reinforcement learning and neural networks and all that. So you get really powerful, like you have a really powerful best response step. Right. That's what was, you know, that's kind of what was new about all this in 2017. Right. Like all of this stuff hadn't really been done before. It was called empirical game theoretic analysis. But like what we did in 2017 was basically just bring in deep reinforcement learning. So, and this is kind of neat. It's kind of, um, it inspired like the main method behind uh, AlphaStar. So it's kind of like it, in a way, AlphaStar does something a lot more sophisticated than this, but it's it's you know in, in the same genre of algorithm. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I mean by game theoretic RL. So that's the, that's the first component, and I'm happy you asked all the questions because really everything kind of builds on that, right? So if you understand the motivations behind this algorithm, uh, the rest is. I think pretty straightforward. Of course, adding search to all this is not straightforward, but uh, but uh, but it's important to understand that basics. Yeah. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about bargaining. We're not going to go into any much detail in bargaining. Okay, but what we're going to be motivated is by this one example. So this, I'm going to call it deal or no deal, but it's been called about 17 different things. It's really just a bilateral uh, alternating bargaining game. Okay, so. Um, the agents start, there's like a pool of items that just appear and the agents have preferences. So the, the green agent really likes books, for example, and he likes hats a little bit. And the yellow and the orange agent uh, likes basketballs and maybe uh, hats more than the green agent. Um, and that's called an instance. So you, you randomly generate these instances of these bargaining games. And what you're going to do next is you're going to bargain for them. You're going to say, I want this one. I'll take these. I'll take two. I'll take a book and two hats, uh, and you can take the rest. You know, and the other agent is going to say, No, no, not quite. I want three basketballs and one hat. You can't have both hats, for example. And you're going to go back and forth. So there's two agents. They're trying to divide up a pool of resources. Each agent has a private evaluation, so that's really important. That's how it's imperfect information. The those preferences of the other agents are not known ahead of time. Okay. The valuations are integer vectors. So it's just like I I have a preference over, well, you can see the number of hearts there kind of uh, encodes their evaluation. And their return is the dot product of whatever they end up with times their evaluation. Okay. So the first thing is the evaluation, the valuations and the resources are drawn from some distribution. There's a, there's a few constraints that you have to put on this problem to make the problem actually interesting. So you have to make, uh, uh, if, if one agent gets everything, then they would get a value of 10. Uh, there's going to be a non-empty overlap uh, of set of items that the players want. Otherwise, there's no real incentive to do bargaining. Uh, and then finally, they just go back and forth um, for a number of rounds uh, until they reach an agreement or the game just stops. Okay. So this is a simple general sum game. It's a two-player game. It's general sum because, uh, you know, the... The, the player's utilities don't necessarily add up to a specific constant. Um, <clears throat> and I think bargaining is a really nice example of a general sum game that we would like learning agents to be able to, to do. Uh, okay, so we're going to be motivated by this example game, and we're going to come back to it at the end. So we did a human study for with our agents on this game. Let's talk a little bit about bargaining. And really, this is just scratching the surface of bargaining. We're going to use one bargaining, uh, um, something one concept from bargaining that I've when I thought, you know, when I discovered it was pretty cool. Okay, so this is called the Nash bargaining solution. So this is a really basic, like first concept in bargaining theory. And what does the Nash bargaining solution say? If you have a number of outcomes, what the Nash bargaining solution wants you to do is pick the outcome that maximizes this product here. And this product is a product over each one of the players, I. And the utility that they got, the expected utility that they would get if they bargained that way, minus some disagreement utility. So if there's no deal, that's what that D value is. So the UI is the utility after the deal, the DI is the no deal baseline, and you're just multiplying this over each one of the agents. Okay. So any whatever uh, what the outcome that, that maximizes this probability is the one that you should be looking for. It's nice because it satisfies four axioms. Um, this is like one of Nash's like seminal papers in the 1950s, same time, like 
he actually published his you know Nash equilibrium, main Nash equilibrium paper and the Nash marketing solution in the same year. That's amazing. Um, but Pareto optimality, I think, is the one I'm gonna prefer. I'm gonna prefer the most. Okay, and I'm gonna give you a bit of motivation for why we we like this. Okay, so I really like this example on this Bakker Stravinsky game. So if you haven't seen this game before, it's two agents, very simple multi uh, matrix game, where there's the row agent prefers Bach. Uh, column agent prefers to go see Stravinsky. These are two, I think, musical composers um, or opera, I think. Um, and so what they would like to do is go together, right? The two people would like to actually go see the same uh, performance. Um, but of course, they want to see the one that they prefer, right? So that's why if, if, um, if they both go to see Bach, they're happy because they get a positive value, but the role player is happier than the column player and vice versa, or Stravinsky. Okay. So here the, the no deal bar the no deal baseline would be zero because you know if you get into an outcome where you don't go see the same show, you're just not happy. You want to be together. Um, so if you do uh, if you're common if you look for pure Nash equilibrium, you'll find uh, BB is a Nash equilibrium and SS is a, is a Nash equilibrium. And if you look at the Nash product that gives you six. Um, but can you do better? Okay. So here, okay, here's a few things where I think this is kind of encapsulates what's nice about the Nash bargaining solution. We're going to define a joint profile, right? So this is a distribution over the cells, not just like a, a policy that each player uses independently. And half of the time you're going to go see Bach and half of the time you're going to go see Stravinsky. That thing gives you an expected utility, each player an expected utility of 2.5. So if you get 2.5 squared, that's 6.25, that's greater than six. So I th what's really nice about, so that's how, that the Nash bargaining solution is going to give, uh, is going to maximize that Nash product. And that's your Pareto optimal solution in this game. I think what's really nice is it's a, it's a really simple example of how uh, bargaining is kind of like implied in, in, in practice, right? Like, uh, you know, there's a nice message at the end of all this is that two players have to compromise to maximize their product of their utilities. Um, and it's fair, right? Each player gets 2.5, right? Rather than a specific Nash equilibrium where one player is always doing better than the other. Um, so that, that's nice. Um, and so we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna use this concept in, in one of our meta solvers. So like I was saying, the um, in PSRO, a lot of the applications that came out uh, were applied and mostly motivated by this two player zero sum game. So we thought when, when, you know, when I saw this, uh, Nash product thing. I was like, hey, wait a second. This is a, you know, we can think of the Nash bargaining solution in the normal form game like I just, like we just did here. And if we do that, can we can apply it as a meta solver in that step where I said we compute a Nash equilibrium. Instead, we can compute a Nash bargaining solution. <clears throat> so that's what we did. We also came up with an, uh, if you look at this, there's a very simple optimization problem to compute this, this thing here, right? Um, if you, uh, if you take that uh, objective function, which is a multiplication, uh, and then you just apply the, the standard trick, right? Just put a log on, on there, and then you get a sum, and you get the sum of the log of the products. This thing is convex if, if it's a joint policy. And so uh, what you can do then is just apply like projected gradient descent. So really you get like this really simple algorithm where uh, you find a gradient of that, uh, of that uh, optimization criteria, right? And then you project it, according to um, how to, you just do basic hill climbing. And then you project it back into the space of like uh, legal probability distributions over the over the joint space, right? So this is really simple application of, yeah, PJ. Yeah. Yep. Oh. A few of the agents can talk this means this thing that you are talking It's a, exactly, it is a joint strategy. So you are coordinating, uh, yes, exactly. There's some kind of coordination happening because you're finding a distribution over the cells. Okay, I'll mostly skip this. This is really like simple application of projected gradient descent. Like we didn't do anything really fancy. So you get, you kind of you kind of import like the, the, the convergence results of pr projected gradient descent. So all this is basically just to show there is a way, like you can uh, decrease the learning rate uh, quadratically and get uh, convergence to the NBS. Um, what's really neat is, so if you've heard of uh, correlated equilibria, um, that's another uh, that's another different concept of uh, an equal, that's another equilibrium concept over the joint space. 
Um, it's different than uh, the NVS. Uh, but what you can, when you go to do, when you go to uh, compute a co correlated equilibrium or a coarse correlated equilibrium, one thing you have to choose uh, is the objective criterion. So like you can do a max welfare uh, correlated equilibrium or something else. Um, like when you come, when you go to define the, uh, the optimization problem for finding a CE, basically you have to give it a, an objective. And so one thing we thought was cool is once we had this um, Nash bargaining solution concept, you can use that as the objective uh, for the, if you want to solve for a correlated equilibrium. So that's just another concept, uh, another solution concept over the joint space. Um, the question is to whether it does better, we don't know. So we did a bunch of experiments and I'll show you how that one. Okay, so this is the kind of the experiments of just the basic PS or O results. There's nothing really um, surprising here. This is in the this is in the case of zero sum games. So what do these what do these graphs mean? Um, the y axis is the what what I've always what I've been calling Nash comb. It's basically like an empirical uh, way to to measure like how close you are to a Nash equilibrium. Just like the distance, uh, think of it as a distance metric for Nash equilibrium. Um, and we just applied it to some little benchmark games, so poker, coon poker, uh, uh, three player coon poker, four player coon poker, and uh, three player lagoon poker. The only thing I want you to take away from this really uh, is that the the old meta solvers that we first used in the original paper actually do uh, surprisingly well. So, you know, why did we do these experiments? Uh, because the essentially the PSRO algorithm, as when it came out, most of the applications of it focused on the two players or some setting. Um, and at that point, we didn't have all these uh, like these different meta solvers. That's what these all these lines are, by the way. All these different meta solvers. So. We didn't even use a Nash equilibrium solver as one of the meta solvers in the, in the original paper. Um, so the only thing I wanted to really say about this is this, this blue line here, this green line, you're going to see that they're low on each one of the graphs. That's regret matching and uh, projected uh, replicator dynamics, which are you know, two meta solvers that we had been using since 2017. And they're actually still doing very well in the case of, uh, <clears throat> in, in the uh, competitive case. So these are all competitive games. Adidas is a new one that came out just last year. This is the only one in our set that's actually guaranteed to converge to a Nash equilibrium in the general case, in like n player general sum. And what's nice about it is we saw that it, we we see that it's stable, but it actually doesn't like it, it doesn't produce strategies that approach Nash equilibria as fast as the ones that are not guaranteed to converge, which I think is interesting. Um, <clears throat> so that that's mostly. I mean, I. That was a sanity check. Um, we did it on one more, well, so we did it on a number of games. This is a very much a summary. So these are two separate graphs now. This game is called Sheriff. It's actually like a, inspired by the Sheriff of Nottingham board games. Like think of a very small version of that, um, where I think your one player is trying to bribe uh, like somebody to, to smuggle things on a ship. And, uh, and you get a payoff if you succeed I forget exactly what the what the rules are. But, um, it's it's non it's non zero sum, so it's hard in the complexity sense. Like solving an equilibrium in this game is really really hard. Um, so you get it's not very clear whether you know whether PS Rowe is doing a good job at solving to get an approximate equilibrium, but it is it is at least some of them are getting uh, you know down to like maybe uh, close to ten to the minus one. Um, and so uh, again, I just want to quote that this is both regret matching and and, and projected uh, replicator dynamics. So they just seem to do a good job of like we're getting like producing a set of policies that cl gets close to a Nash equilibrium. What we were happy with is we looked at another thing, which is the social welfare. So the social welfare is basically like uh, you know the sum of each player's utilities in this game, right? And so a lot of the equilibrium techniques are not going to get you a high social welfare because they're not actually optimizing for that. Well, there's no reason to expect that they would. Right? Um, but our, our Nash bargaining solution ones um, tend to. Right? So this is this gray line here is the NBS, that's the joint uh, Nash bargaining solution. It gets it, it does very, very well. So I, I like this graph. The reason I like this graph on the right is because one thing we kind of like when we focused on this two player zero sum setting, we really talked about Nash equilibrium and that was kind of the motivation. Let's define like, let's find 
strategies that approximate the Nash equilibrium. We knew the entire time, like that's not, you know, that's not the end goal. There's a lot of more general games where just finding a Nash equilibrium is not necessarily the thing you want to do. And so uh, I was happy to see that um, with these different uh, meta solvers now that you can find uh, a much higher social welfare in a game where that kind of matters. So, um, but but at the end of the day, you know, one set of techniques is finding a Nash equilibrium or is approaching a Nash equilibrium faster, and the other is kind of maximizing the social welfare. So, what does that mean? Okay, I'll answer that a bit better. So we ran we ran our techniques on a larger game called Color Trails, and this is starting to be more like a negotiation game. So uh, there's three player. It's a three player game. Uh, player one and player two. Uh, you get these configurations again, uh, and they they play the game on the grid. So you you start with a configuration that looks like this: player one, player two, and a receiver, which is player three really, uh, are trying to get to the flag. And you get these you get these colored chips, and you you can use these colored chips to approach the flag. And there's a there's an initial round of bargaining that happens between the uh, player one and the receiver, and player two and the receiver. And so the player one says to the receiver, I'd like to offer you this for this, like maybe one red for a green or something. Um, and then the player two can offer something to the receiver as well. And then the receiver can accept one of those deals or just reject both. And essentially what the players have to do after that is take, uh, take a number of actions to get to the flag. And they just spend essentially their tokens on getting as close to the flag as they possibly can. That's called Color Trails. It it was a very popular game, like uh, in the multi-agent RL or just multi-agent systems literature from 2010, I would say, to 2018. It was very popular, um, and it, it was cool because um, it's a very simple game, and, and but again, it's non-zero sum and it's sequential. Um, so because it, it has this negotiation style, we were interested in this, especially because you can uh, you can generate different instances, right? And ask questions about, uh, you know, how the how the agents generalize. Okay, so what's, okay. So one thing that's really cool about this domain in particular is that there's only one round of bargaining and it ends. After you do the bargaining, you, you spend all of your tokens, get as close to the flag as you can, and then the game ends, okay? So what you can do, because the game is actually small enough, you can enumerate every possible way that players can bargain. So that's what these little circles are here. And you can kind of look at the Pareto front. So the game is small enough that you can do this. So, uh, you know, if, if, you know, if the agents part in one way, they go here, they get this outcome, they get this outcome, et cetera. And then you can actually draw the Pareto front for each one of these instances of this colored trails game. And this had been done in the, in the previous literature. So we were naturally curious. Um, Okay, because we saw these PSRO results that kind of looked like, oh, we're either finding the national equilibrium or we're increasing social welfare. Like, well, we kind of want to do both, right? That's the kind of point. Um, so we said, okay, well, let's try color trails. And we can kind of map, like, as you run the algorithms, you can kind of show where in this Pareto space your agent is landing. Like, how close are you getting to this Pareto front? Um, and so we graph that as well. Like you can graph the distance to the front as a function of the number of iterations of the algorithm. And uh, what we, you know, what we were happy about was that the, uh, the two that are uh, using uh, the Nash bargaining solution are getting like visibly closer, or, or reducing, getting closer to the Pareto front than uh, than the other methods. The one thing we were a bit surprised by was the 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 this correlated equilibrium uh, version of the uh, max NBS problem just didn't do as well as we expected, but the uh, but it was cool. It was it was neat. Like I, it it, it was a uh, it was not something we didn't analyze PSRO in this way up until now, uh, in in this context. So I thought that was okay. Let's see how I'm doing for time. Okay, so this is this is where we integrate. So this is the part three is where we integrate search. Okay, so this this will either be the hardest part of the talk for you or the easiest, depending on your background. <laughs> so, uh, but let's let's talk about some exciting things first. Okay, alpha zero and uh, the use of search in DeepRL. 
So you might have heard of AlphaZero. And what AlphaZero did was it leveraged uh, search and deep reinforcement learning um, in, in like a, I think, uh, like a, a very, well, a unique way at the time. Um, the, the Go, the, the uh, the, the Go community up to that point really didn't expect uh, that you would be able to just take Monte Carlo tree search and uh, learn a value function through deep reinforcement learning and you know achieve like a, a very strong uh, Go plane agent. But uh, essentially that's what the Alpha Zero algorithm does is it, it, um, it, it, it simulates uh, search and via Monte Carlo tree search enhanced with uh, value functions and policy networks, uh, and it leverages basically the computation computation power of search to improve its policy. Okay, so you might have heard of Alpha Zero. Uh, there have been other algorithms applied to other uh, domains, such as Rebel, Player of Games, or uh, Diplomacy. The point is that you can le leverage search to scale very, uh, very well. Okay, so let's like let's take a quick look at how Alpha Zero actually works. So Alpha Zero has these networks here, which are these are neural networks. So you get like your observation or your, your game state in uh, as input, and you have a policy and a value network uh, on the output. And it's going to uh, enhance Monte Carlo tree search by doing uh, position estimates, and it's going to use its policy to kind of guide the search. And it's going to do that by uh, self-play RL. So it's gonna it's gonna generate a lot of trajectories. It's gonna learn a value function from those trajectories and a policy network. And it's gonna improve everything using Monte Carlo tree search. Now what's amazing about all this is that it's a really nice uh, strong application of uh, approximate dynamic program. Mm -hmm. So if you know like how reinforcement learning generally works, uh, you know you find a policy and then you improve that policy by you know going and uh, finding a value function and then just trying to you know, the action that summarizes your value function at the next state. Well, what Monte Carlo Tree Search did is it did this by using search. Okay. Now this gets really hard and then you learn this, you use these in, uh, in to refine the search as I said. Okay. What this, okay. So what's actually difficult about, it's not easy to take Monte Carlo Tree Search and just apply it to an imperfect information. Um, it's it's limited to two players or some games and games with like large transitive components. So like you said, you know, we could use it for chess. Um, and what we want to do is extend Alpha Zero uh, to games with imperfect information like poker or bargaining games. Okay, and use a game theoretic loop for general sum games. Okay, so how do we do this? So this is really not easy because when you come to apply Monte Carlo tree search, you actually uh, like, let's say you're playing poker. You don't have a game state, right? You have, uh, you don't really know what state you're in because you don't know what your opponent's cards are, right? So you can't really just do Monte Carlo tree search in the usual way that you would apply on chess or go or shogi. So the first thing you have to do is you have to think you might be in multiple states, right? So that's what that red circle is up there. And you have to sample like one of them, right? And so there's a number of different ways you can do this, right? Like, so the, you know, if you're, if you think of it as a POM DP, uh, there's this nice algorithm called POM CP that was used, particle filtering. Uh, the original information set, Monte Carlo tree search, just randomly did, like sample the state from all of these possible states. Um, but there's a number of things you can do. Um, and, but, you know, the one thing that you can do is also just learn it, right? You can learn. There's a distribution here that samples states that will let you do a Monte Carlo, a Monte Carlo style tree search. And you could just learn that. And that's what we're gonna do. So to handle large um, belief spaces, like, you know, think of the game of Stratego. I don't know if you know that game, but like the number of states here is just combinatorially large, right? Because in Stratego, you actually, uh, you know, put your pieces behind a wall and Nobody knows how you place your pieces. So the, there's a really large number of different possible like world states you could be in given what you know, right? So you can't, you have to find a way of sampling those if you want to use uh, search. Well, and, clear, yeah. What you're trying to do here is to model kind of like a distribution of like 
what space you might be in that are uh, consistent. With Correct. The partial exactly right. Yep. That's exactly right. Yep. And we're going to do something with that. We're going to, once we have that, we can apply Monte Carlo tree search in a specific way. Okay. So one thing that had not been done up to that point was uh, do this approximately by adding a new head onto this uh, policy and value net. This is the generative model net. Right? So this thing is just generating one potential gain state given what's consistent with all your observations. Okay, so it's just a generator. What's really nice about this is it's very simple to do. You can actually learn that G head just by uh, supervised learning. Because when you're actually uh, running Monte Carlo tree search or running some self-play improvement algorithm, uh, if you do it in the imperfect information case, you actually need to sample a game state at some point because the, you will never get utilities if you don't, right? So at some, when you're actually doing self-play, you need to have a game state, which means when you're running uh, Monte Carlo tree search, there is a state that you have, which is an underlying state. So you can just use that thing as a, as a value target when you're training your policies. So it's really like straight up supervised learning. You're kind of learning the distribution of data um, in self -level. Okay. Okay. So the question is, does this actually work? So, okay. So the search part, the entire search part of the algorithm was only used for this best response step of the uh, PSRO loop. Okay. So like we're assuming the opponent is fixed or we're sampling from a set of different policies and we're trying to compute like an approximate best response to it. Okay. That, that part and that, it's quite important. So before we even plug it into the rest of this machinery, we can ask, well, does it actually work as a general, uh, as, a, as an approximate best response altogether? So like basically what this slide is trying to answer is if I fix my opponent in some game, like um, can I find, can I improve the, uh, the best response step by applying search on top of it? Okay, so we did that with three different opponents. So this was in the deal or no deal bargaining game I showed you earlier. So <clears throat> if you have a random opponent, so just choosing uniform randomly, we have all these different ways that you can do the, that you can sample the generative model. One of them is the actual correct one. So if you go back here, I mean, this might not be, it, 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 I'm gonna make it sound trivial, but it's not. Um, there's a way of computing. I mean, there is there exists a posterior here for each one of these, like a true posterior. And you can get that, you can compute that from your opponent's policies. Like if you know what your opponent policy is, you can actually compute what the likelihood of each one of those states is under their policy, right? Because the only thing you're missing is the imperfect information, right? So you can actually go and compute like how likely is all the, oh, this state under their policy? How likely is this state under their policy? And if you normalize that, you'll get the, the real posterior. So in a game that's small enough, if you have, if you can enumerate all the different sources of imperfect information, you could actually compute the posterior here, which is the case for this game. So that's what this, this, uh, this exact here is, this purple line up here. So the, the, the line on the top, so this is a, this is an expected return. Basically what these graphs are showing you <clears throat> is how well you can do uh, trying to learn a best response to a uniform policy of the opponent. Now it turns out the uniform policy of the opponent is really easy to compute a best response. To. So almost all of the generative models are gonna be the same. Uh, but you can also use just DQN, like, right? Like let's not use search. Uh, we're just gonna try and use DQN. How good is DQN in finding a best response to the uniform policy? Well, it turns out not as good as the search-based methods because these are all search-based methods. And so that's kind of one thing that the this graph is showing you, but it catches up, right? The game is small enough that you know DQN can do as well as the search methods uh, with, with enough data. So this was against the random opponent. Here, that's a different one. We let DQN train against the random opponent. And then we call that the agent that we're trying to exploit. And so that one's a little better than the uniform. Right. And that's where you now start to see this like you know separation between uh, each one of the methods. So of course the posterior is always the highest. Like if you have the true posterior and you're trying to compute a best response, uh, 
No, that, that's the best thing you can do. Our simple learning method is this brown one here. And it kind of like starts out nicely, like kind of gradually gets to the uh, to, to do as well as the true posterior, which is nice because it's entirely learned from data. So we're not, you know, the true posterior leverages information you're not supposed to have, which is the opponent pause. And you see DQN also can do pretty well. These are like uh, logarithmic on the y-axis, right? So this is actually quite good. And I mean, the, the, the third graph is just another opponent that's just harder. So if you let DQN play itself, like against itself, uh, you can try and exploit that opponent. And I think the important part here that when I was excited about was this brown graph just keeps going up towards the posterior. So that's the learned one, right? The two, the red one and the uh, and the purple one are are use information that you actually don't have at playtime. So it's kind of I was kind of happy that the generative model is working as expected. Yeah. Okay. I left myself ten minutes. Um, let's see. I don't think there's there's only yeah there's only a few things I'm more I want to show you. Maybe what I'll do is skip skip most of this. Um, what's neat about having uh, the search, yeah, I won't go through this in detail. What's neat about having the search on top of everything, like if you put all these components together now, so remember what the components are. It's basically PSRO. Um, what did we do? We added uh, like a meta solver based on bargaining theory that computes like the Nash bargaining solution in the meta game. What's the other thing we did? We augmented the best response step with search. So we put these things all together. What's neat about uh, the final agent is that it's getting much closer to what I would call a general agent. <laughs> so, yes, some heavy machinery to get there. Um, <clears throat> but you can think of, I, I just want to sell this a little bit, but I won't cover the slide in, in any detail. Um, you can think of, like, if I'm playing against an, uh, a, a random opponent um, and I don't know anything about them, what do I do, right? Like, if I'm bargaining with one of you, I have, you know, I've never met you before, right? Like, I, I don't know, how do, you, how do you bargain? I have no idea. Or, you know, do you act in one way or the other? Well, what I would like to do is I would like to use my life experience to kind of have like a decent bargaining strategy. And then as I play you more, you know, I see what kind of bargaining or how you play a bargaining game. And then I alter my strategy to get either better, uh, either more exploitative or more cooperative, one or the one or two. And so what I like about this combine algorithm is it gives you this kind of Bayesian interpretation where at training time, I'm learning a set of um, like possible types of my opponents, right? So I'm, you know, I'm enumerating the different policies my opponents could use. And then uh, when I come to meet them and play against them, I'm going to do this kind of like Bayesian uh, modeling of, of matching them to matching their my observations with one of the uh, agents that I played with during my training uh, training time, and then uh, just use that information to uh, to kind of infer which one of the policies uh, I learned in my training at my at training time is the one, uh, is the one that you're using, and then kind of I know how to respond to that, so I kind of dynamically like uh, adjust my strategy uh, at test time. I know it's hard to appreciate because you know you have to go through the math. But I mean, you have to really understand like the, the techniques to 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 really like to see how you get there. But um, I didn't want I did want to leave time for our human study because that's actually quite exciting. So let's do the. I'll I'll just finish with that then. So you might have seen like there. The, okay, maybe it's a little bit obvious. There's a lot of different knobs you can turn in these algorithms. It's a complex algorithm, right? So we built up. Um, let's see, what do we do? Yeah, we built up a number of agents by tweaking each one of these settings. And at the end of the day, we had to do, we wanted to do a human study. So we ended up with like 112 different uh, agents, depending on how you set things, right? We can't play 112 agents against a bunch of humans and make any kind of meaningful conclusions. So, um, so what we did was we took up the 112 agents we, we uh, trained, we looked at how they play against each other. So we did one large matrix of 112 entry rows and columns. Um, and we chose based on uh, some metrics, the two 
most competitive agents. So the ones that individually maximize their utility, um, the most cooperative agents. So you can kind of look at an agent and see if that agent plays against 112 other agents, is the combined total of the utility between the two players high? And for the you know for the agent that maximizes that metric, we're going to call it the cooperative agent. And then we're going to look at one that's the fairest agent, where so you can do come something similar, where you look at the difference in utilities between uh, the agent and say the uh, the human, or the or the agent and the other agent, and you can say um, is that agent fair in the sense that you know is it getting utilities that are similar to the other uh, to the other player, um, or is there a large imbalance? So we hand selected uh, some agents according to these metrics. We also used an independent DQN agent. So we trained these, these agents in this bargaining game, deal or no deal. Um, and we played them against humans. So we got 346 games. Um, the human, so this is, it's not trivial to do these human studies because you have to teach the humans how to play this game. You have to get them to use the interface and that kind of thing. So after filtering games that didn't make sense, we had 346 usable games. Um, what, and we did the human versus human and human versus agents. So the human versus human, on average, um, can get uh, get this utility of six point ninety three. So uh, remember what this utility is. It's uh, it's how many uh, it's your, it's your preference your preference vector that you get generated times like the uh, the items that you have at the end of the game. So if you let humans play against humans, they get on average six point six point ninety three. So about seven. Okay. So what do all these numbers mean? All right. So what we did, so so our goal was, of course, like, let's try and beat that. That's what I was hoping, right? If we can get an agent playing against human that does better than humans versus humans, that was the goal. But we didn't quite get that. That's hard. Um, we got some interesting things. We learned a few things. So um, this is what this, like, if you just took DQN off the shelf and played it against itself in this game, this is what this one is here, independent RL. Right? And, and here's what these numbers mean. So... When we play independent RL against humans in this game, in this party game, uh, the humans get on average 5.86. Uh, the DQN agent gets on average 6.5. And the combined average is 6.18. And the things in brackets are just confidence intervals. This is this Nash product thing I was talking about before, right? So this you can think of as, like if you're looking for the Nash bargaining solution, you want this thing to be really high. Okay, so here's what you, here's one thing that surprised me, was that uh, DQN uh, among the agents, like these were our PSRO agents here, DQN actually does uh, the strongest against all the humans. And if you look at the actual bargaining games it plays, it is really an agent you don't want to play against. <laughs> it, it basically just keeps saying, uh, I'll take all the items in the pool. I'll take all the items in the pool. And that's it. <laughs> and it does that until the last round. And then uh, if it played first, it gets all the items because <laughs> the human has no incentive but to do otherwise. It's basically an ultimating game. So it drops down to an ultimating game. Um, and so our competitive agents uh, didn't do as well as I thought. So maximizing utility on its own, like selecting the agents that maximize utility, their own individual utility, uh, didn't end up uh, doing too well. But in terms of uh, like the co our cooperative agent, got 6.7, 6.17. Um, and our fair agent was really neat because it was the one that if you look at the combined utilities, it got the highest. Uh, and so it was the only one actually that was able to uh, overlap in its confidence intervals with the, the human human average. So yeah, that was an interesting finding. I did not expect that. Um, so it's possible that like the way that it plays uh, by remaining fair, uh, ends up getting a, a nice, a very good combined utility. It does, of course, give away some potential utility to do that. So it's not getting as high as the DQN agent. But when you look at the combined score here, like for example, the humans do really well against that like fair agent. Um, so that was cool. Um, I was happy that we did um, uh, a human study and uh, yeah, learn a few things. So of course we still want to beat that six point nine three, but you know we're we're a ways from that. But we're getting there. Um, okay, so what did what does this work? Uh, we present 
uh, a general purpose multi-agent RL loop that combines alpha zero style search, PSRL, and <clears throat> uh, bargaining theory. Um, future directions, we, you know, there's maybe potentially other ways we can build out the population, uh, other ways to train the Monte Carlo, the policy and value nets in MCTS. Um, there's other way, there's, you know, at the end of the day, we found it really tough. Like when you have a general sum game, you can, it's hard to answer the question, is your agent good? Right, because you don't really have uh, a good metric, right? Like uh, we played it against humans and, it, you know, maybe there's a better way to do that. But, you know, we're having a hard time doing that in general in multi-agent RL. Uh, and I think most of the time what we do is we play it against humans and we make assessments based on that, right? But is there a better way to do that? So that was it.